These are the sermons Moses preached to all Israel when they were east of the Jordan River in the Araba wilderness, opposite Suf, in the vicinity of Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hazroth, and Dizahab. It takes eleven days to travel from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea following the Mount Seir route. It was on the first day of the eleventh month of the fortieth year when Moses addressed the people of Israel, telling them everything God had commanded him concerning them. This came after he had defeated Sion king of the Amorites, who ruled from Heshbon, and Og king of Bashan, who ruled from Ashtaroth in Edrei. It was east of the Jordan in the land of Moab that Moses set out to explain this revelation. He said, Back at Horeb, God, our God, spoke to us, You've stayed long enough at this mountain. On your way now. Get moving. Head for the Amorite hills, wherever people are living in the Araba, the mountains, the foothills, the Negev, the seashore, the Canaanite country and the Lebanon all the way to the big river, the Euphrates. Look, I've given you this land. Now go in and take it. It's the land God promised to give your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their children after them. At the time I told you, I can't do this, can't carry you all by myself. God, your God, has multiplied your numbers. Why, look at you, you rival the stars in the sky. And may God, the God of your fathers, keep it up and multiply you another thousand times, bless you just as he promised. But how can I carry, all by myself, your troubles and burdens and quarrels? So select some wise, understanding, and seasoned men from your tribes, and I will commission them as your leaders. You answered me, good. A good solution. So I went ahead and took the top men of your tribes, wise and seasoned, and made them your leaders, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, officials adequate for each of your tribes. At the same time I gave orders to your judges, listen carefully to complaints and accusations between your fellow Israelites. Judge fairly between each person and his fellow or foreigner. Don't play favorites, treat the little and the big alike, listen carefully to each. Don't be impressed by big names. This is God's judgment you're dealing with. Hard cases you can bring to me, I'll deal with them. I issued orders to you at that time regarding everything you would have to deal with. Then we set out from Horeb and headed for the Amorite hill country, going through that huge and frightening wilderness that you've had more than an eyeful of by now, all under the command of God, our God, and finally arrived at Kadesh Barnea. There I told you, you've made it to the Amorite hill country that God, our God, is giving us. Look, God, your God, has placed this land as a gift before you. Go ahead and take it now. God, the God of your fathers, promised it to you. Don't be afraid. Don't lose heart. But then you all came to me and said, Let's send some men on ahead to scout out the land for us and bring back a report on the best route to take and the kinds of towns we can expect to find. That seemed like a good idea to me, so I picked twelve men, one from each tribe. They set out, climbing through the hills. They came to the Eshkol Valley and looked it over. They took samples of the produce of the land and brought them back to us, saying, It's a good land that God, our God, is giving us. But then you weren't willing to go up. You rebelled against God, your God's plain word. You complained in your tents, God hates us. He hauled us out of Egypt in order to dump us among the Amorites, a death sentence for sure. How can we go up? We're trapped in a dead end. Our brothers took all the wind out of our sails, telling us, 
the people are bigger and stronger than we are, their cities are huge, their defense is massive, we even saw Anakite giants there. I tried to relieve your fears, don't be terrified of them. God, your God, is leading the way, he's fighting for you. You saw with your own eyes what he did for you in Egypt, you saw what he did in the wilderness, how God, your God, carried you as a father carries his child, carried you the whole way until you arrived here. But now that you're here, you won't trust God, your God, this same God who goes ahead of you in your travels to scout out a place to pitch camp, a fire by night and a cloud by day to show you the way to go. When God heard what you said, he exploded in anger. He swore, not a single person of this evil generation is going to get so much as a look at the good land that I promised to give to your parents. Not one, except for Caleb son of Jephunneh. He'll see it. I'll give him and his descendants the land he walked on because he was all for following God, heart and soul. But I also got it. Because of you God's anger spilled over onto me. He said, you aren't getting in either. Your assistant, Joshua son of Nun, will go in. Build up his courage. He's the one who will claim the inheritance for Israel. And your babies of whom you said, they'll be grabbed for plunder, and all these little kids who right now don't even know right from wrong, they'll get in. I'll give it to them. Yes, they'll be the new owners. But not you. Turn around and head back into the wilderness following the route to the Red Sea. You spoke up, we've sinned against God. We'll go up and fight, following all the orders that God, our God, has commanded. You took your weapons and dressed for battle, you thought it would be so easy going into those hills. But God told me, tell them, don't do it, don't go up to fight, I'm not with you in this. Your enemies will waste you. I told you but you wouldn't listen. You rebelled at the plain word of God. You threw out your chests and strutted into the hills. And those Amorites, who had lived in those hills all their lives, swarmed all over you like a hive of bees, chasing you from Seir all the way to Horma, a stinging defeat. You came back and wept in the presence of God, but he didn't pay a bit of attention to you, God didn't give you the time of day. You stayed there in Kadesh a long time, about as long as you had stayed there earlier. Then we turned around and went back into the wilderness following the route to the Red Sea, as God had instructed me. We worked our way in and around the hills of Seir for a long, long time. Then God said, you've been going around in circles in these hills long enough, go north. Command the people, you're about to cut through the land belonging to your relatives, the people of Esau who settled in Seir. They are terrified of you, but restrain yourselves. Don't try and start a fight. I am not giving you so much as a square inch of their land. I've already given all the hill country of Seir to Esau, he owns it all. Pay them up front for any food or water you get from them. God, your God, has blessed you in everything you have done. He has guarded you in your travels through this immense wilderness. For forty years now, God, your God, has been right here with you. You haven't lacked one thing. So we detoured around our brothers, the people of Esau who live in Seir, avoiding the Araba road that comes up from Elath and Ezi and Jeber, instead we used the road through the wilderness of Moab. God told me, and don't try to pick a fight with the Moabites. I am not giving you any of their land. I've given ownership of Ar to the people of Lot. The Emites, monsters, used to live there, mobs of hulking giants, like Anakites. Along with the Anakites they were lumped in with the Rephates, 
ghosts, but in Moab they were called Emites. Horites also used to live in Seir, but the descendants of Esau took over and destroyed them, the same as Israel did in the land God gave them to possess. God said, It's time now to cross the brook Seard. So we crossed the brook Seard. It took us thirty-eight years to get from Kadesh Barnea to the brook Seard. That's how long it took for the entire generation of soldiers from the camp to die off, as God had sworn they would. God was relentless against them until the last one was gone from the camp. When the last of these soldiers had died, God said to me, This is the day you cut across the territory of Moab, at Ar. When you approach the people of Ammon, don't try and pick a fight with them because I'm not giving you any of the land of the people of Ammon for yourselves, I've already given it to the people of Lot. It is also considered to have once been the land of the Rephates. Rephates lived there long ago, the Ammonites called them Zamzamites, barbarians, huge mobs of them, giants like the Anakites. God destroyed them and the Ammonites moved in and took over. It was the same with the people of Esau who live in Seir, God got rid of the Horites who lived there earlier and they moved in and took over, as you can see. Regarding the Avites who lived in villages as far as Gaza, the Kaphtarites who came from Kaphtar, Crete, wiped them out and moved in. On your feet now. Get started. Cross the brook Arnon. Look, here's Sion the Amorite king of Heshbon and his land. I'm handing it over to you, it's all yours. Go ahead, take it go to war with him. Before the day is out, I'll make sure that all the people around here are thoroughly terrified. Rumors of you are going to spread like wildfire, they'll totally panic. From the wilderness of Kedemoth, I sent messengers to Sion, king of Heshbon. They carried a friendly message, let me cross through your land on the highway. I'll stay right on the highway, I won't trespass right or left. I'll pay you for any food or water we might need. Let me walk through. The people of Esau who live in Seir and the Moabites who live in Ar did this, helping me on my way until I can cross the Jordan and enter the land that God, our God, is giving us. But Sion king of Heshbon wouldn't let us cross his land. God, your God, turned his spirit mean in his heart heart so he could hand him over to you, as you can see that he has done. Then God said to me, Look, I've got the ball rolling, Sion and his land are soon yours. Go ahead. Take it. It's practically yours. So Sion and his entire army confronted us in battle at Jahaz. God handed him, his sons, and his entire army over to us and we utterly crushed them. While we were at it we captured all his towns and totally destroyed them, a holy destruction, men, women, and children. No survivors. We took the livestock and the plunder from the towns we had captured and carried them off for ourselves. From Aroer on the edge of the brook Arnon and the town in the gorge, as far as Gilead, not a single town proved too much for us, God, our God, gave every last one of them to us. The only land you didn't take, obeying God's command, was the land of the people of Ammon, the land along the Jabbok and around the cities in the hills. Then we turned north and took the road to Bashan. O G king of Bashan, he and all his people, came out to meet us in battle at Edrei. God said to me, Don't be afraid of him, I'm turning him over to you, along with his whole army in his land. Treat him the way you treated Sion king of the Amorites who ruled from Heshbon. So God, our God, also handed O.G. king of Bashan over to us, O.G. and all his people, and we utterly crushed them. Again, no survivors. 
At the same time we took all his cities. There wasn't one of the sixty cities that we didn't take, the whole region of Argob, Og's kingdom in Bashan. All these cities were fortress cities with high walls and barred gates. There were also numerous unwalled villages. We totally destroyed them, a holy destruction. It was the same treatment we gave to Sion king of Heshbon, a holy destruction of every city, man, woman, and child. But all the livestock and plunder from the cities we took for ourselves. Throughout that time we took the land from under the control of the two kings of the Amorites who ruled the country east of the Jordan, all the way from the brook Arnon to Mount Hermon. Sir Ion is the name given Hermon by the Sidonians, the Amorites call it Sinir. We took all the towns of the plateau, everything in Gilead, everything in Bashan, as far as Selika and Edrei, the border towns of Bashan, Og's kingdom. O.G. king of Bashan was the last remaining refate. His bed, made of iron, was over thirteen feet long and six wide. You can still see it on display in Rabbah of the people of Ammon. Of the land that we possessed at that time, I gave the Reubenites and the Gadites the territory north of Aroer along the brook Arnon and half the hill country of Gilead with its towns. I gave the half-tribe of Manasseh the rest of Gilead and all of Bashan, Og's kingdom, all the region of Argob, which takes in all of Bashan. This used to be known as the land of the Rephates. Jair, a son of Manasseh, got the region of Argob to the borders of the Jeshurites and Machathites. He named the Bashan villages after himself, Havath Jair, Jair's tent villages. They're still called that. I gave Gilead to Makir. I gave the Reubenites and Gadites the land from Gilead down to the brook Arnon, whose middle was the boundary, and as far as the Jabbok River, the boundary line of the people of Ammon. The western boundary was the Jordan River in the Arabah all the way from the Kinnereth, the Sea of Galilee, to the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea or Dead Sea, at the base of the slopes of Mount Pisgah on the east. I commanded you at that time, God, your God, has given you this land to possess. Your men, fit and armed for the fight, are to cross the river in advance of their brothers, the people of Israel. Only your wives, children, and livestock, I know you have much livestock, may go ahead and settle down in the towns I have already given you until God secures living space for your brothers as he has for you and they have taken possession of the country west of the Jordan that God, your God, is giving them. After that, each man may return to the land I've given you here. I commanded Joshua at that time, you've seen with your own two eyes everything God, your God, has done to these two kings. God is going to do the same thing to all the kingdoms over there across the river where you're headed. Don't be afraid of them. God, your God, he's fighting for you. At that same time, I begged God, God, my master, you let me in on the beginnings, you let me see your greatness, you let me see your might, what God in heaven or earth can do anything like what you've done. Please, let me in also on the endings, let me cross the river and see the good land over the Jordan, the lush hills, the Lebanon mountains. But God was still angry with me because of you. He wouldn't listen. He said, enough of that. Not another word from you on this. Climb to the top of Mount Pisgah and look around, look west, north, south, east. Take in the land with your own eyes. Take a good look because you're not going to cross this Jordan. Then command Joshua, give him courage. Give him strength. Single-handed he will lead this people across the river. Single-handed he'll cause them to inherit the land at which you can only look. 
That's why we have stayed in this valley near Beth Peor. Now listen, Israel, listen carefully to the rules and regulations that I am teaching you to follow so that you may live and enter and take possession of the land that God, the God of your fathers, is giving to you. Don't add a word to what I command you, and don't remove a word from it. Keep the commands of God, your God, that I am commanding you. You saw with your own eyes what God did at Baal Peor, how God destroyed from among you every man who joined in the Baal Peor orgies. But you, the ones who held tight to God, your God, are alive and well, every one of you, today. Pay attention, I'm teaching you the rules and regulations that God commanded me, so that you may live by them in the land you are entering to take up ownership. Keep them. Practice them. You'll become wise and understanding. When people hear and see what's going on, they'll say, what a great nation. So wise, so understanding. We've never seen anything like it. Yes. What other great nation has gods that are intimate with them the way God, our God, is with us, always ready to listen to us? And what other great nation has rules and regulations as good and fair as this revelation that I'm setting before you today? Just make sure you stay alert. Keep close watch over yourselves. Don't forget anything of what you've seen. Don't let your heart wander off. Stay vigilant as long as you live. Teach what you've seen and heard to your children and grandchildren. That day when you stood before God, your God, at Horeb, God said to me, Assemble the people in my presence to listen to my words so that they will learn to fear me in holy fear for as long as they live on the land, and then they will teach these same words to their children. You gathered. You stood in the shadow of the mountain. The mountain was ablaze with fire, blazing high into the very heart of heaven. You stood in deep darkness and thick clouds. God spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words but you saw nothing, no form, only a voice. He announced his covenant, the ten words, by which he commanded you to live. Then he wrote them down on two slabs of stone. And God commanded me at that time to teach you the rules and regulations that you are to live by in the land which you are crossing over the Jordan to possess. You saw no form on the day God spoke to you at Horeb from out of the fire. Remember that. Carefully guard yourselves so that you don't turn corrupt and make a form, carving a figure that looks male or female or looks like a prowling animal or a flying bird or a slithering snake or a fish in a stream. And also carefully guard yourselves so that you don't look up into the skies and see the sun and moon and stars, all the constellations of the skies, and be seduced into worshipping and serving them. God set them out for everybody's benefit, everywhere. But you, God took you right out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to become the people of his inheritance, and that's what you are this very day. But God was angry with me because of you and the things you said. He swore that I'd never cross the Jordan, never get to enter the good land that God, your God, is giving you as an inheritance. This means that I am going to die here. I'm not crossing the Jordan. But you will cross, you'll possess the good land. So stay alert. Don't for a minute forget the covenant which God, your God, made with you. And don't take up with any carved images, no forms of any kind, God, your God, issued clear commands on that. God, your God, is not to be trifled with, he's a consuming fire, a jealous God. When the time comes that you have children and grandchildren, put on years, and start taking things for granted, if you then become corrupt and make any carved images, no matter what their form, 
by doing what is sheer evil in God's eyes and provoking his anger, I can tell you right now, with heaven and earth as witnesses, that it will be all over for you. You'll be kicked off the land that you're about to cross over the Jordan to possess. Believe me, you'll have a very short stay there. You'll be ruined, completely ruined. God will scatter you far and wide, a few of you will survive here and there in the nations where God will drive you. There you can worship your homemade gods to your heart's content, your wonderful gods of wood and stone that can't see or hear or eat or smell. But even there, if you seek God, your God, you'll be able to find him if you're serious, looking for him with your whole heart and soul. When troubles come and all these awful things happen to you, in future days you will come back to God, your God, and listen obediently to what he says. God, your God, is above all a compassionate God. In the end he will not abandon you, he won't bring you to ruin, he won't forget the covenant with your ancestors which he swore to them. Ask questions. Find out what has been going on all these years before you were born. From the day God created man and woman on this earth, and from the horizon in the east to the horizon in the west, as far back as you can imagine and as far away as you can imagine, has as great a thing as this ever happened? Has anyone ever heard of such a thing? Has a people ever heard, as you did, a God speaking out of the middle of the fire and lived to tell the story? Or has a God ever tried to select for himself a nation from within a nation using trials, miracles, and war, putting his strong hand in, reaching his long arm out, a spectacle awesome and staggering, the way God, your God, did it for you in Egypt while you stood right there and watched. You were shown all this so that you would know that God is, well, God. He's the only God there is. He's it. He made it possible for you to hear his voice out of heaven to discipline you. Down on earth, he showed you the big fire and again you heard his words, this time out of the fire. He loved your ancestors and chose to work with their children. He personally and powerfully brought you out of Egypt in order to displace bigger and stronger and older nations with you, bringing you out and turning their land over to you as an inheritance. And now it's happening. This very day. Know this well, then. Take it to heart right now, God is in heaven above, God is on earth below. He's the only God there is. Obediently live by his rules and commands which I'm giving you today so that you'll live well and your children after you, oh, you'll live a long time in the land that God, your God, is giving you. Then Moses set aside three towns in the country on the east side of the Jordan to which someone who had unintentionally killed a person could flee and find refuge. If the murder was unintentional and there was no history of bad blood, the murderer could flee to one of these cities and save his life. Bezer in the wilderness on the tableland for the Reubenites, Ramoth in Gilead for the Gadites, and Golan in Bashan for the Manassites. This is the revelation that Moses presented to the people of Israel. These are the testimonies, the rules and regulations Moses spoke to the people of Israel after their exodus from Egypt and arrival on the east side of the Jordan in the valley near Beth Peor. It was the country of Sion king of the Amorites who ruled from Heshbon. Moses and the people of Israel fought and beat him after they left Egypt and took his land. They also took the land of O.G. king of Bashan. The two Amorite kings held the country on the east of the Jordan from Aroer on the bank of the brook Arnon as far north as Mount Sion, that is, Mount Hermon, all the Araba plain east of the Jordan, and as far south as the Sea of the Araba, the Dead Sea, beneath the slopes of Mount Pisgah. Moses called all Israel together. He said to them, Attention, Israel! 
Listen obediently to the rules and regulations I am delivering to your listening ears today. Learn them. Live them. God, our God, made a covenant with us at Horeb. God didn't just make this covenant with our parents, He made it also with us, with all of us who are alive right now. God spoke to you personally out of the fire on the mountain. At the time I stood between God and you, to tell you what God said. You were afraid, remember, of the fire and wouldn't climb the mountain. He said. I am God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a house of slaves. No other gods, only me. No carved gods of any size, shape, or form of anything whatever, whether of things that fly or walk or swim. Don't bow down to them and don't serve them because I am God, your God, and I'm a most jealous God. I hold parents responsible for any sins they pass on to their children to the third, and yes, even to the fourth generation. But I'm lovingly loyal to the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. No using the name of God, your God, in curses or silly banter, God won't put up with the irreverent use of His name. No working on the Sabbath, keep it holy just as God, your God, commanded you. Work six days, doing everything you have to do, but the seventh day is a Sabbath, a rest day, no work, not you, your son, your daughter, your servant, your maid, your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, and not even the foreigner visiting your town. That way your servants and maids will get the same rest as you. Don't ever forget that you were slaves in Egypt and God, your God, got you out of there in a powerful show of strength. That's why God, your God, commands you to observe the day of Sabbath rest. Respect your father and mother, God, your God, commands it. You'll have a long life, the land that God is giving you will treat you well. No murder. No adultery. No stealing. No lies about your neighbor. No coveting your neighbor's wife. And no lusting for his house, field, servant, maid, ox, or donkey either, nothing that belongs to your neighbor. These are the words that God spoke to the whole congregation at the mountain. He spoke in a tremendous voice from the fire and cloud and dark mist. And that was it. No more words. Then he wrote them on two slabs of stone and gave them to me. As it turned out, when you heard the voice out of that dark cloud and saw the mountain on fire, you approached me, all the heads of your tribes and your leaders, and said, Our God has revealed to us his glory and greatness. We've heard him speak from the fire today. We've seen that God can speak to humans and they can still live. But why risk it further? This huge fire will devour us if we stay around any longer. If we hear God's voice anymore, we'll die for sure. Has anyone ever known of anyone who has heard the voice of God the way we have and lived to tell the story? From now on, you go and listen to what God, our God, says and then tell us what God tells you. We'll listen and we'll do it. God heard what you said to me and told me, I've heard what the people said to you. They're right, good and true words. What I wouldn't give if they'd always feel this way, continuing to revere me and always keep all my commands, they'd have a good life forever, they and their children. Go ahead and tell them to go home to their tents. But you, you stay here with me so I can tell you every commandment and all the rules and regulations that you must teach them so they'll know how to live in the land that I'm giving them as their own. So be very careful to act exactly as God commands you. Don't veer off to the right or the left. 
Walk straight down the road God commands so that you'll have a good life and live a long time in the land that you're about to possess. This is the commandment, the rules and regulations, that God, your God, commanded me to teach you to live out in the land you're about to cross into to possess. This is so that you'll live in deep reverence before God lifelong, observing all his rules and regulations that I'm commanding you, you and your children and your grandchildren, living good long lives. Listen obediently, Israel. Do what you're told so that you'll have a good life, a life of abundance and bounty, just as God promised, in a land abounding in milk and honey. Attention, Israel. God, our God. God the one and only. Love God, your God, with your whole heart, love Him with all that's in you, love Him with all you've got. Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street, talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Tie them on your hands and foreheads as a reminder, inscribe them on the doorposts of your homes and on your city gates. When God, your God, ushers you into the land He promised through your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, you're going to walk into large, bustling cities you didn't build, well-furnished houses you didn't buy, come upon wells you didn't dig, vineyards and olive orchards you didn't plant. When you take it all in and settle down, pleased and content, make sure you don't forget how you got there, God brought you out of slavery in Egypt. Deeply respect God, your God. Serve and worship Him exclusively. Back up your promises with His name only. Don't fool around with other gods, the gods of your neighbors, because God, your God, who is alive among you is a jealous God. Don't provoke Him, igniting His hot anger that would burn you right off the face of the earth. Don't push God, your God, to the wall as you did that day at Massa, the testing place. Carefully keep the commands of God, your God, all the requirements and regulations He gave you. Do what is right, do what is good in God's sight so you'll live a good life and be able to march in and take this pleasant land that God so solemnly promised through your ancestors, throwing out your enemies left and right, exactly as God said. The next time your child asks you, what do these requirements and regulations and rules that God, our God, has commanded mean, tell your child, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt and God powerfully intervened and got us out of that country. We stood there and watched as God delivered miracle signs, great wonders, and evil visitations on Egypt, on Pharaoh and his household. He pulled us out of there so he could bring us here and give us the land he so solemnly promised to our ancestors. That's why God commanded us to follow all these rules, so that we would live reverently before God, our God, as He gives us this good life, keeping us alive for a long time to come. It will be a set right and put together life for us if we make sure that we do this entire commandment in the presence of God, our God, just as He commanded us to do. When God, your God, brings you into the country that you are about to enter and take over, he will clear out the superpowers that were there before you, the Hittite, the Girgashite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Those seven nations are all bigger and stronger than you are. God, your God, will turn them over to you and you will conquer them. You must completely destroy them, offering them up as a holy destruction to God. Don't make a treaty with them. Don't let them off in any way. Don't marry them, don't give your daughters to their sons and don't take their daughters for your sons, before you know it they'd involve you in worshipping their gods, and God would explode in anger, putting a quick end to you. 
Here's what you are to do. Tear apart their altars stone by stone. Smash their phallic pillars. Chop down their sex and religion Asherah groves. Set fire to their carved god images. Do this because you are a people set apart as holy to God, your God. God, your God, chose you out of all the people on earth for himself as a cherished, personal treasure. God wasn't attracted to you and didn't choose you because you were big and important, the fact is, there was almost nothing to you. He did it out of sheer love, keeping the promise he made to your ancestors. God stepped in and mightily bought you back out of that world of slavery, freed you from the iron grip of Pharaoh king of Egypt. Know this, God, your God, is God indeed, a God you can depend upon. He keeps his covenant of loyal love with those who love him and observe his commandments for a thousand generations. But he also pays back those who hate him, pays them the wages of death, he isn't slow to pay them off, those who hate him, he pays right on time. So keep the command and the rules and regulations that I command you today. Do them. And this is what will happen, when you, on your part, will obey these directives, keeping and following them, God, on his part, will keep the covenant of loyal love that he made with your ancestors. He will love you. He will bless you. He will increase you. He will bless the babies from your womb and the harvest of grain, new wine, and oil from your fields, he'll bless the calves from your herds and lambs from your flocks in the country he promised your ancestors that he'd give you. You'll be blessed beyond all other peoples, no sterility or barrenness in you or your animals. God will get rid of all sickness. And all the evil afflictions you experienced in Egypt he'll put not on you but on those who hate you. You'll make mincemeat of all the peoples that God, your God, hands over to you. Don't feel sorry for them. And don't worship their gods, they'll trap you for sure. You're going to think to yourselves, oh. We're outnumbered ten to one by these nations. We'll never even make a dent in them. But I'm telling you, don't be afraid. Remember, yes, remember in detail what God, your God, did to Pharaoh and all Egypt. Remember the great contests to which you were eyewitnesses, the miracle signs, the wonders, God's mighty hand as he stretched out his arm and took you out of there. God, your God, is going to do the same thing to these people you're now so afraid of. And to top it off, the hornet. God will unleash the hornet on them until every survivor in hiding is dead. So don't be intimidated by them. God, your God, is among you, majestic God, awesome God. God, your God, will get rid of these nations, bit by bit. You won't be permitted to wipe them out all at once lest the wild animals take over and overwhelm you. But God, your God, will move them out of your way, he'll throw them into a huge panic until there's nothing left of them. He'll turn their kings over to you and you'll remove all trace of them under heaven. Not one person will be able to stand up to you, you'll put an end to them all. Make sure you set fire to their carved gods. Don't get greedy for the veneer of silver and gold on them and take it for yourselves, you'll get trapped by it for sure. God hates it, it's an abomination to God, your God. And don't dare bring one of these abominations home or you'll end up just like it, burned up as a holy destruction. No, it is forbidden. Hate it. Abominate it. Destroy it and preserve God's holiness. Keep and live out the entire commandment that I'm commanding you today so that you'll live and prosper and enter and own the land that God promised to your ancestors. 
Remember every road that God led you on for those forty years in the wilderness, pushing you to your limits, testing you so that he would know what you were made of, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He put you through hard times. He made you go hungry. Then he fed you with manna, something neither you nor your parents knew anything about, so you would learn that men and women don't live by bread only, we live by every word that comes from God's mouth. Your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister those forty years. You learn deep in your heart that God disciplines you in the same ways a father disciplines his child. So it's paramount that you keep the commandments of God, your God, walk down the roads he shows you and reverently respect him. God is about to bring you into a good land, a land with brooks and rivers, springs and lakes, streams out of the hills and through the valleys. It's a land of wheat and barley, of vines and figs and pomegranates, of olives, oil, and honey. It's land where you'll never go hungry, always food on the table and a roof over your head. It's a land where you'll get iron out of rocks and mine copper from the hills. After a meal, satisfied, bless God, your God, for the good land He has given you. Make sure you don't forget God, your God, by not keeping His commandments, His rules and regulations that I command you today. Make sure that when you eat and are satisfied, build pleasant houses and settle in, see your herds and flocks flourish and more and more money come in, watch your standard of living going up and up, make sure you don't become so full of yourself and your things that you forget God, your God. The God who delivered you from Egyptian slavery. The God who led you through that huge and fearsome wilderness, those desolate, arid badlands crawling with fiery snakes and scorpions. The God who gave you water gushing from hard rock. The God who gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never heard of, in order to give you a taste of the hard life, to test you so that you would be prepared to live well in the days ahead of you. If you start thinking to yourselves, I did all this. And all by myself. I'm rich. It's all mine. Well, think again. Remember that God, your God, gave you the strength to produce all this wealth so as to confirm the covenant that he promised to your ancestors, as it is today. If you forget, forget God, your God, and start taking up with other gods, serving and worshipping them, I'm on record right now as giving you firm warning, that will be the end of you, I mean it, destruction. You'll go to your doom, the same as the nations God is destroying before you, doom because you wouldn't obey the voice of God, your God. Attention, Israel. This very day you are crossing the Jordan to enter the land and oust nations that are much bigger and stronger than you are. You're going to find huge cities with sky-high fortress walls and gigantic people, descendants of the Anakites, you've heard all about them, you've heard the saying, no one can stand up to an Anakite. Today know this, God, your God, is crossing the river ahead of you, he's a consuming fire. He will destroy the nations, he will put them under your power. You will oust them and very quickly wipe them out, just as God promised you would. But when God pushes them out ahead of you, don't start thinking to yourselves, it's because of all the good I've done that God has brought me in here to dispossess these nations. Actually it's because of all the evil these nations have done. No, it's nothing good that you've done, no record for decency that you've built up, that got you here, it's because of the vile wickedness of these nations that God, your God, is dispossessing them before you so that he can keep his promised word to your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Know this and don't ever forget it, it's not because of any good that you've done that God is giving you this good land to own. Anything but. You're stubborn as mules. 
Keep in mind and don't ever forget how angry you made God, your God, in the wilderness. You've kicked and screamed against God from the day you left Egypt until you got to this place, rebels all the way. You made God angry at Horeb, made him so angry that he wanted to destroy you. When I climbed the mountain to receive the slabs of stone, the tablets of the covenant that God made with you, I stayed there on the mountain forty days and nights, I ate no food, I drank no water. Then God gave me the two slabs of stone, engraved with the finger of God. They contained word for word everything that God spoke to you on the mountain out of the fire, on the day of the assembly. It was at the end of the forty days and nights that God gave me the two slabs of stone, the tablets of the covenant. God said to me, Get going, and quickly. Get down there because your people whom you led out of Egypt have ruined everything. In almost no time at all they have left the road that I laid out for them and gone off and made for themselves a cast God. God said, I look at this people and all I see are hard-headed, hard-hearted rebels. Get out of my way now so I can destroy them. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the map. Then I'll start over with you to make a nation far better and bigger than they could ever be. I turned around and started down the mountain, by now the mountain was blazing with fire, carrying the two tablets of the covenant in my two arms. That's when I saw it, there you were, sinning against God, your God, you had made yourselves a cast God in the shape of a calf. So soon you had left the road that God had commanded you to walk on. I held the two stone slabs high and threw them down, smashing them to bits as you watched. Then I flung myself down before God, just as I had at the beginning of the forty days and nights. I ate no food, I drank no water. I did this because of you, all your sins, sinning against God, doing what is evil in God's eyes and making him angry. I was terrified of God's furious anger, his blazing anger. I was sure he would destroy you. But once again God listened to me. And Aaron. How furious he was with Aaron, ready to destroy him. But I prayed also for Aaron at that same time. But that sin thing that you made, that calf god, I took and burned in the fire, pounded and ground it until it was crushed into a fine powder, then threw it into the stream that comes down the mountain. And then there was Camp Tabra, Blaze, Massa, Testing Place, and Camp Kybroth Hadavava, Graves of the Craving, more occasions when you made God furious with you. The most recent was when God sent you out from Kadesh Barnea, ordering you, Go! Possess the land that I'm giving you. And what did you do? You rebelled. Rebelled against the clear orders of God, your God. Refused to trust Him. Wouldn't obey Him. You've been rebels against God from the first day I knew you. When I was on my face, stretched out before God those forty days and nights after God said He would destroy you, I prayed to God for you, my master, God, don't destroy your people, your inheritance whom, in your immense generosity, you redeemed, using your enormous strength to get them out of Egypt. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, don't make too much of the stubbornness of this people, their evil and their sin, lest the Egyptians from whom you rescued them say, God couldn't do it. He got tired and wasn't able to take them to the land he promised them. He ended up hating them and dumped them in the wilderness to die. They are your people still, your inheritance whom you powerfully and sovereignly rescued. God responded. He said, shape two slabs of stone similar to the first ones. Climb the mountain and meet me. Also make yourself a wooden chest. I will engrave the stone slabs with the words that were on the first ones, the ones you smashed. 
then you will put them in the chest. So I made a chest out of acacia wood, shaped two slabs of stone, just like the first ones, and climbed the mountain with the two slabs in my arms. He engraved the stone slabs the same as he had the first ones, the ten words that he addressed to you on the mountain out of the fire on the day of the assembly. Then God gave them to me. I turned around and came down the mountain. I put the stone slabs in the chest that I made and they've been there ever since, just as God commanded me. The people of Israel went from the wells of the Jochenites to Mozirah. Aaron died there and was buried. His son Eleazar succeeded him as priest. From there they went to Gadgoda, and then to Jotbatha, a land of streams of water. That's when God set apart the tribe of Levi to carry God's covenant chest, to be on duty in the presence of God, to serve Him, and to bless in His name, as they continue to do today. And that's why Levites don't have a piece of inherited land as their kinsmen do. God is their inheritance, as God, your God, promised them. I stayed there on the mountain forty days and nights, just as I did the first time. And God listened to me, just as he did the first time, God decided not to destroy you. God told me, now get going. Lead your people as they resume the journey to take possession of the land that I promised their ancestors that I'd give to them. So now Israel, what do you think God expects from you? Just this, live in his presence in holy reverence, follow the road he sets out for you, love him, serve God, your God, with everything you have in you, obey the commandments and regulations of God that I'm commanding you today, live a good life. Look around you, everything you see is God's, the heavens above and beyond, the earth, and everything on it. But it was your ancestors who God fell in love with, he picked their children, that's you, out of all the other peoples. That's where we are right now. So cut away the thick calluses from your heart and stop being so willfully hard-headed. God, your God, is the God of all gods, He's the master of all masters, a God immense and powerful and awesome. He doesn't play favorites, takes no bribes, makes sure orphans and widows are treated fairly, takes loving care of foreigners by seeing that they get food and clothing. You must treat foreigners with the same loving care. Remember, you were once foreigners in Egypt. Reverently respect God, your God, serve Him, hold tight to Him. Back up your promises with the authority of His name. He's your praise. He's your God. He did all these tremendous, these staggering things. That you saw with your own eyes. When your ancestors entered Egypt, they numbered a mere seventy souls. And now look at you, you look more like the stars in the night skies in number. And your God did it. So love God, your God. Guard well his rules and regulations. Obey his commandments for the rest of time. Today it's very clear that it isn't your children who are front and center here, they weren't in on what God did, didn't see the acts, didn't experience the discipline, didn't marvel at his greatness, the way he displayed his power in the miracle signs and deeds that he let loose in Egypt on Pharaoh king of Egypt and all his land the way he took care of the Egyptian army, its horses and chariots, burying them in the waters of the Red Sea as they pursued you. God drowned them. And you're standing here today alive. Nor was it your children who saw how God took care of you in the wilderness up until the time you arrived here, what he did to Dathan and Abram, the sons of Eliab son of Reuben, how the earth opened its jaws and swallowed them with their families, their tents, and everything around them, right out of the middle of Israel. Yes, it was you, your eyes, that saw every great thing that God did. 
So it's you who are in charge of keeping the entire commandment that I command you today so that you'll have the strength to invade and possess the land that you are crossing the river to make your own. Your obedience will give you a long life on the soil that God promised to give your ancestors and their children, a land flowing with milk and honey. The land you are entering to take up ownership isn't like Egypt, the land you left, where you had to plant your own seed and water it yourselves as in a vegetable garden. But the land you are about to cross the river and take for your own is a land of mountains and valleys, it drinks water that rains from the sky. It's a land that God, your God, personally tends, He's the gardener, He alone keeps His eye on it all year long. From now on if you listen obediently to the commandments that I am commanding you today, love God, your God, and serve Him with everything you have within you, He'll take charge of sending the rain at the right time, both autumn and spring rains, so that you'll be able to harvest your grain, your grapes, your olives. He'll make sure there's plenty of grass for your animals. You'll have plenty to eat. But be vigilant lest you be seduced away and end up serving and worshipping other gods and God erupts in anger and shuts down heaven so there's no rain and nothing grows in the fields, and in no time at all you're starved out, not a trace of you left on the good land that God is giving you. Place these words on your hearts. Get them deep inside you. Tie them on your hands and foreheads as a reminder. Teach them to your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning until you fall into bed at night. Inscribe them on the doorposts and gates of your city so that you'll live a long time, and your children with you, on the soil that God promised to give your ancestors for as long as there is a sky over the earth. That's right. If you diligently keep all this commandment that I command you to obey, love God, your God, do what He tells you, stick close to Him, God on His part will drive out all these nations that stand in your way. Yes, He'll drive out nations much bigger and stronger than you. Every square inch on which you place your foot will be yours. Your borders will stretch from the wilderness to the mountains of Lebanon, from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand in your way. Everywhere you go, God sent fear and trembling will precede you, just as He promised. I've brought you today to the crossroads of blessing and curse. The blessing, if you listen obediently to the commandments of God, your God, which I command you today. The curse, if you don't pay attention to the commandments of God, your God, but leave the road that I command you today, following other gods of which you know nothing. Here's what comes next, when God, your God, brings you into the land you are going into to make your own, you are to give out the blessing from Mount Gerizim and the curse from Mount Ebel. After you cross the Jordan River, Follow the road to the west through Canaanite settlements in the valley near Gilgal and the Oaks of Moor. You are crossing the Jordan River to invade and take the land that God, your God, is giving you. Be vigilant. Observe all the regulations and rules I am setting before you today. These are the rules and regulations that you must diligently observe for as long as you live in this country that God, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess. Ruthlessly demolish all the sacred shrines where the nations that you're driving out worship their gods, wherever you find them, on hills and mountains or in groves of green trees. Tear apart their altars. Smash their phallic pillars. Burn their sex and religion Asherah shrines. Break up their carved gods. Obliterate the names of those God sites. Stay clear of those places, don't let what went on there contaminate the worship of God, your God. Instead find the site that God, your God, 
will choose and mark it with his name as a common center for all the tribes of Israel. Assemble there. Bring to that place your absolution offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and tribute offerings, your vow offerings, your freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. Feast there in the presence of God, your God. Celebrate everything that you and your families have accomplished under the blessing of God, your God. Don't continue doing things the way we're doing them at present, each of us doing as we wish. Until now you haven't arrived at the goal, the resting place, the inheritance that God, your God, is giving you. But the minute you cross the Jordan River and settle into the land God, your God, is enabling you to inherit, he'll give you rest from all your surrounding enemies. You'll be able to settle down and live in safety. From then on, at the place that God, your God, chooses to mark with his name as the place where you can meet him, bring everything that I command you, your absolution offerings and sacrifices, tithes and tribute offerings, and the best of your vow offerings that you vow to God. Celebrate there in the presence of God, your God, you and your sons and daughters, your servants and maids, including the Levite living in your neighborhood because he has no place of his own in your inheritance. Be extra careful, don't offer your absolution offerings just any place that strikes your fancy. Offer your absolution offerings only in the place that God chooses in one of your tribal regions. There and only there are you to bring all that I command you. It's permissible to slaughter your non-sacrificial animals like gazelle and deer in your towns and eat all you want from them with the blessing of God, your God. Both the ritually clean and unclean may eat. But you may not eat the blood. Pour the blood out on the ground like water. Nor may you eat there the tithe of your grain, new wine, or olive oil, nor the firstborn of your herds and flocks, nor any of the vow offerings that you vow, nor your free will offerings and tribute offerings. All these you must eat in the presence of God, your God, in the place God, your God, chooses, you, your son and daughter, your servant and maid, and the Levite who lives in your neighborhood. You are to celebrate in the presence of God, your God, all the things you've been able to accomplish. And make sure that for as long as you live on your land you never, never neglect the Levite. When God, your God, expands your territory as he promised he would do, and you say, I'm hungry for meat, because you happen to be craving meat at the time, go ahead and eat as much meat as you want. If you're too far away from the place that God, your God, has marked with his name, it's all right to slaughter animals from your herds and flocks that God has given you, as I've commanded you. In your own towns you may eat as much of them as you want. Just as the non-sacrificial animals like the gazelle and deer are eaten, you may eat them, the ritually unclean and clean may eat them at the same table. Only this, absolutely no blood. Don't eat the blood. Blood is life, don't eat the life with the meat. Don't eat it, pour it out on the ground like water. Don't eat it, then you'll have a good life, you and your children after you. By all means, do the right thing in God's eyes. And this, lift high your holy offerings and your vow offerings and bring them to the place God designates. Sacrifice your absolution offerings, the meat and blood, on the altar of God, your God, pour out the blood of the absolution offering on the altar of God, your God, then you can go ahead and eat the meat. Be vigilant, listen obediently to these words that I command you so that you'll have a good life, you and your children, for a long, long time, doing what is good and right in the eyes of God, your God. When God, your God, cuts off the nations whose land you are invading, shoves them out of your way so that you displace them and settle in their land, 
be careful that you don't get curious about them after they've been destroyed before you. Don't get fascinated with their gods, thinking, I wonder what it was like for them, worshipping their gods. I'd like to try that myself. Don't do this to God, your God. They commit every imaginable abomination with their gods. God hates it all with a passion. Why, they even set their children on fire as offerings to their gods. Diligently do everything I command you, the way I command you, don't add to it, don't subtract from it. When a prophet or visionary gets up in your community and gives out a miracle sign or wonder, and the miracle sign or wonder that he gave out happens and he says, let's follow other gods, these are gods you know nothing about, let's worship them, don't pay any attention to what that prophet or visionary says. God, your God, is testing you to find out if you totally love him with everything you have in you. You are to follow only God, your God, hold him in deep reverence, keep his commandments, listen obediently to what he says, serve him, hold on to him for dear life. And that prophet or visionary must be put to death. He has urged mutiny against God, your God, who rescued you from Egypt, who redeemed you from a world of slavery and put you on the road on which God, your God, has commanded you to walk purge the evil from your company. And when your brother or son or daughter, or even your dear wife or lifelong friend, comes to you in secret and whispers, let's go and worship some other gods, gods that you know nothing about, neither you nor your ancestors, the gods of the peoples around you near and far, from one end of the earth to the other, don't go along with him, shut your ears. Don't feel sorry for him and don't make excuses for him. Kill him. That's right, kill him. You throw the first stone. Take action at once and swiftly with everybody in the community getting in on it at the end. Stone him with stones so that he dies. He tried to turn you traitor against God, your God, the one who got you out of Egypt and the world of slavery. Every man, woman, and child in Israel will hear what's been done and be in awe. No one will dare to do an evil thing like this again. When word comes in from one of your cities that God, your God, is giving you to live in, reporting that evil men have gotten together with some of the citizens of the city and have broken away, saying, let's go and worship other gods, gods you know nothing about then you must conduct a careful examination. Ask questions, investigate. If it turns out that the report is true and this abomination did in fact take place in your community, you must execute the citizens of that town. Kill them, setting that city apart for holy destruction, the city and everything in it including its animals. Gather the plunder in the middle of the town square and burn it all, town and plunder together up in smoke, a holy sacrifice to God, your God. Leave it there, ashes and ruins. Don't build on that site again. And don't let any of the plunder devoted to holy destruction stick to your fingers. Get rid of it so that God may turn from anger to compassion, generously making you prosper, just as he promised your ancestors. Yes. Obediently listen to God, your God. Keep all his commands that I am giving you today. Do the right thing in the eyes of God, your God. You are children of God, your God, so don't mutilate your bodies or shave your heads in funeral rites for the dead. You only are a people holy to God, your God. God chose you out of all the people on earth as his cherished personal treasure. Don't eat anything abominable. These are the animals you may eat, ox, sheep, goat, deer, gazelle, roebuck, wild goat, ibex, antelope, mountain sheep, any animal that has a cloven hoof and chews the cud. But you may not eat camels, rabbits, 
and rock badgers because they chew the cud but they don't have a cloven hoof, that makes them ritually unclean. And pigs, don't eat pigs, they have a cloven hoof but don't chew the cud, which makes them ritually unclean. Don't even touch a pig's carcass. This is what you may eat from the water, anything that has fins and scales. But if it doesn't have fins or scales, you may not eat it. It's ritually unclean. You may eat any ritually clean bird. These are the exceptions, so don't eat these, eagle, vulture, black vulture, kite, falcon, the buzzard family, the raven family, ostrich, nighthawk, the hawk family, little owl, great owl, white owl, pelican, osprey, cormorant, stork, the heron family, hoopoe, bat. Winged insects are ritually unclean, don't eat them. But ritually clean winged creatures are permitted. Because you are a people holy to God, your God, don't eat anything that you find dead. You can, though, give it to a foreigner in your neighborhood for a meal or sell it to a foreigner. Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Make an offering of 10%, a tithe, of all the produce which grows in your fields year after year. Bring this into the presence of God, your God, at the place He designates for worship and there eat the tithe from your grain, wine, and oil and the firstborn from your herds and flocks. In this way you will learn to live in deep reverence before God, your God, as long as you live. But if the place God, your God, designates for worship is too far away and you can't carry your tithe that far, God, your God, will still bless you, exchange your tithe for money and take the money to the place God, your God, has chosen to be worshipped. Use the money to buy anything you want, cattle, sheep, wine, or beer, anything that looks good to you. You and your family can then feast in the presence of God, your God, and have a good time. Meanwhile, don't forget to take good care of the Levites who live in your towns, they won't get any property or inheritance of their own as you will. At the end of every third year, gather the tithe from all your produce of that year and put it aside in storage. Keep it in reserve for the Levite who won't get any property or inheritance as you will, and for the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow who live in your neighborhood. That way they'll have plenty to eat and God, your God, will bless you in all your work. At the end of every seventh year, cancel all debts. This is the procedure, everyone who has lent money to a neighbor writes it off. You must not press your neighbor or his brother for payment, all debts are cancelled, God says so. You may collect payment from foreigners, but whatever you have lent to your fellow Israelite you must write off. There must be no poor people among you because God is going to bless you lavishly in this land that God, your God, is giving you as an inheritance, your very own land. But only if you listen obediently to the voice of God, your God, diligently observing every commandment that I command you today. Oh yes, God, your God, will bless you just as He promised. You will lend to many nations but won't borrow from any, you'll rule over many nations but none will rule over you. When you happen on someone who's in trouble or needs help among your people with whom you live in this land that God, your God, is giving you, don't look the other way pretending you don't see him. Don't keep a tight grip on your purse. No. Look at him, open your purse, lend whatever and as much as he needs. Don't count the cost. Don't listen to that selfish voice saying, it's almost the seventh year, the year of all debts are cancelled, and turn aside and leave your needy neighbor in the lurch, refusing to help him. He'll call God's attention to you and your blatant sin. Give freely and spontaneously. Don't have a stingy heart. 
The way you handle matters like this triggers God, your God's, blessing in everything you do, all your work and ventures. There are always going to be poor and needy people among you. So I command you, always be generous, open purse and hands, give to your neighbors in trouble, your poor and hurting neighbors. If a Hebrew man or Hebrew woman was sold to you and has served you for six years, in the seventh year you must set him or her free, released into a free life. And when you set them free don't send them off empty-handed. Provide them with some animals, plenty of bread and wine and oil. Load them with provisions from all the blessings with which God, your God, has blessed you. Don't for a minute forget that you were once slaves in Egypt and God, your God, redeemed you from that slave world. For that reason, this day I command you to do this. But if your slave, because he loves you and your family and has a good life with you, says, I don't want to leave you, then take an awl and pierce through his earlobe into the doorpost, marking him as your slave forever. Do the same with your women slaves who want to stay with you. Don't consider this an unreasonable hardship, this setting your slave free. After all, he's worked six years for you at half the cost of a hired hand. Believe me, God, your God, will bless you in everything you do. Set apart to God, your God, all the firstborn males in your herds and flocks. Don't use the firstborn from your herds as work animals, don't shear the firstborn from your flocks. These are for you to eat every year, you and your family, in the presence of God, your God, at the place that God designates for worship. If the animal is defective, lame, say, or blind, anything wrong with it, don't slaughter it as a sacrifice to God, your God. Stay at home and eat it there. Both the ritually clean and unclean may eat it, the same as with a gazelle or a deer. Only you must not eat its blood. Pour the blood out on the ground like water. Observe the month of Abib by celebrating the Passover to God, your God. It was in the month of Abib that God, your God, delivered you by night from Egypt. Offer the Passover sacrifice to God, your God, at the place God chooses to be worshipped by establishing His name there. Don't eat yeast bread with it, for seven days eat it with unraised bread, hard times bread, because you left Egypt in a hurry, that bread will keep the memory fresh of how you left Egypt for as long as you live. There is to be no sign of yeast anywhere for seven days. And don't let any of the meat that you sacrifice in the evening be left over until morning. Don't sacrifice the Passover in any of the towns that God, your God, gives you other than the one God, your God, designates for worship, there and there only you will offer the Passover sacrifice at evening as the sun goes down, marking the time that you left Egypt. Boil and eat it at the place designated by God, your God. Then, at daybreak, turn around and go home. Eat unraised bread for six days. Set aside the seventh day as a holiday, don't do any work. Starting from the day you put the sickle to the ripe grain, count out seven weeks. Celebrate the Feast of Weeks to God, your God, by bringing your free will offering, give as generously as God, your God, has blessed you. Rejoice in the presence of God, your God, you, your son, your daughter, your servant, your maid, the Levite who lives in your neighborhood, the foreigner, the orphan and widow among you, rejoice at the place God, your God, will set aside to be worshipped. Don't forget that you were once a slave in Egypt. So be diligent in observing these regulations. Observe the Feast of Booths for seven days when you gather the harvest from your threshing floor and your wine vat. Rejoice at your festival, you, your son, your daughter, your servant, your maid, the Levite, the foreigner, 
and the orphans and widows who live in your neighborhood. Celebrate the feast to God, your God, for seven days at the place God designates. God, your God, has been blessing you in your harvest and in all your work, so make a day of it, really celebrate. All your men must appear before God, your God, three times each year at the place he designates, at the Feast of Unraised Bread, Passover, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths. No one is to show up in the presence of God empty-handed, each man must bring as much as he can manage, giving generously in response to the blessings of God, your God. Appoint judges and officers, organized by tribes, in all the towns that God, your God, is giving you. They are to judge the people fairly and honestly. Don't twist the law. Don't play favorites. Don't take a bribe, a bribe blinds even a wise person it undermines the intentions of the best of people. The right. The right. Pursue only what's right. It's the only way you can really live and possess the land that God, your God, is giving you. Don't plant fertility ashira trees alongside the altar of God, your God, that you build. Don't set up phallic sex pillars, God, your God, hates them. And don't sacrifice to God, your God, an ox or sheep that is defective or has anything at all wrong with it. That's an abomination, an insult to God, your God. If you find anyone within the towns that God, your God, is giving you doing what is wrong in God's eyes, breaking his covenant by going off to worship other gods, bowing down to them, the sun, say, or the moon, or any rebel sky gods, look at the evidence and investigate carefully. If you find that it is true, that, in fact, an abomination has been committed in Israel, then you are to take the man or woman who did this evil thing outside your city gates and stone the man or the woman. Hurl stones at the person until dead. But only on the testimony of two or three witnesses may a person be put to death. No one may be put to death on the testimony of one witness. The witnesses must throw the first stones in the execution, then the rest of the community joins in. You have to purge the evil from your community. When matters of justice come up that are too much for you, hard cases regarding homicides, legal disputes, fights, take them up to the central place of worship that God, your God, has designated. Bring them to the Levitical priests and the judge who is in office at the time. Consult them and they will hand down the decision for you. Then carry out their verdict at the place designated by God, your God. Do what they tell you, in exactly the way they tell you. Follow their instructions precisely, don't leave out anything, don't add anything. Anyone who presumes to override or twist the decision handed down by the priest or judge who was acting in the presence of God, your God, is as good as dead, root him out, rid Israel of the evil. Everyone will take notice and be impressed. That will put an end to presumptuous behavior. When you enter the land that God, your God, is giving you and take it over and settle down, and then say, I'm going to get me a king, a king like all the nations around me, make sure you get yourself a king whom God, your God, chooses. Choose your king from among your kinsmen, don't take a foreigner, only a kinsman. And make sure he doesn't build up a war machine, amassing military horses and chariots. He must not send people to Egypt to get more horses, because God told you, you'll never go back there again. And make sure he doesn't build up a harem, collecting wives who will divert him from the straight and narrow. And make sure he doesn't pile up a lot of silver and gold. This is what must be done, when he sits down on the throne of his kingdom, the first thing he must do is make himself a copy of this revelation on a scroll, 
copied under the supervision of the Levitical priests. That scroll is to remain at his side at all times, he is to study it every day so that he may learn what it means to fear his God, living in reverent obedience before these rules and regulations by following them. He must not become proud and arrogant, changing the commands at whim to suit himself or making up his own versions. If he reads and learns, he will have a long reign as king in Israel, he and his sons. The Levitical priests, that's the entire tribe of Levi, don't get any land inheritance with the rest of Israel. They get the fire gift offerings of God, they will live on that inheritance. But they don't get land inheritance like the rest of their kinsmen. God is their inheritance. This is what the priests get from the people from any offering of an ox or a sheep, the shoulder, the two cheeks, and the stomach. You must also give them the first fruits of your grain, wine, and oil and the first fleece of your sheep, because God, your God, has chosen only them and their children out of all your tribes to be present and serve always in the name of God, your God. If a Levite moves from any town in Israel, and he is quite free to move wherever he desires, and comes to the place God designates for worship, he may serve there in the name of God along with all his brother Levites who are present and serving in the presence of God. And he will get an equal share to eat, even though he has money from the sale of his parents' possessions. When you enter the land that God, your God, is giving you, don't take on the abominable ways of life of the nations there. Don't you dare sacrifice your son or daughter in the fire. Don't practice divination, sorcery, fortune-telling, witchery, casting spells, holding seances, or channeling with the dead. People who do these things are an abomination to God. It's because of just such abominable practices that God, your God, is driving these nations out before you. Be completely loyal to God, your God. These nations that you're about to run out of the country consort with sorcerers and witches. But not you. God, your God, forbids it. God, your God, is going to raise up a prophet for you. God will raise him up from among your kinsmen, a prophet like me. Listen obediently to him. This is what you asked God, your God, for at Horeb on the day you were all gathered at the mountain and said, We can't hear any more from God, our God, we can't stand seeing any more fire. We'll die. And God said to me, They're right, they've spoken the truth. I'll raise up for them a prophet like you from their kinsmen. I'll tell him what to say and he will pass on to them everything I command him. And anyone who won't listen to my words spoken by him, I will personally hold responsible. But any prophet who fakes it, who claims to speak in my name something I haven't commanded him to say, or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet must die. You may be wondering among yourselves, how can we tell the difference, whether it was God who spoke or not. Here's how. If what the prophet spoke in God's name doesn't happen, then obviously God wasn't behind it, the prophet made it up. Forget about him. When God, your God, throws the nations out of the country that God, your God, is giving you and you settle down in their cities and houses, you are to set aside three easily accessible cities in the land that God, your God, is giving you as your very own. Divide your land into thirds, this land that God, your God, is giving you to possess, and build roads to the town so that anyone who accidentally kills another can flee there. This is the guideline for the murderer who flees there to take refuge, he has to have killed his neighbor without premeditation and with no history of bad blood between them. For instance, a man goes with his neighbor into the woods to cut a tree, he swings the axe, the head slips off the handle and hits his neighbor, killing him. 
he may then flee to one of these cities and save his life. If the city is too far away, the avenger of blood racing in hot-blooded pursuit might catch him since it's such a long distance, and kill him even though he didn't deserve it. It wasn't his fault. There was no history of hatred between them. Therefore I command you, set aside the three cities for yourselves. When God, your God, enlarges your land, extending its borders as he solemnly promised your ancestors, by giving you the whole land he promised them because you are diligently living the way I'm commanding you today, namely, to love God, your God, and do what he tells you all your life, and when that happens, then add three more to these three cities so that there is no chance of innocent blood being spilled in your land. God, your God, is giving you this land as an inheritance, you don't want to pollute it with innocent blood and bring guilt upon yourselves. On the other hand, if a man with a history of hatred toward his neighbor waits in ambush, then jumps him, mauls and kills him, and then runs to one of these cities, that's a different story. The elders of his own city are to send for him and have him brought back. They are to hand him over to the avenger of blood for execution don't feel sorry for him. Clean out the pollution of wrongful murder from Israel so that you'll be able to live well and breathe clean air. Don't move your neighbor's boundary markers, the long-standing landmarks set up by your pioneer ancestors defining their property. You cannot convict anyone of a crime or sin on the word of one witness. You need two or three witnesses to make a case. If a hostile witness stands to accuse someone of a wrong, then both parties involved in the quarrel must stand in the presence of God before the priests and judges who are in office at that time. The judges must conduct a careful investigation, if the witness turns out to be a false witness and has lied against his fellow Israelite, give him the same medicine he intended for the other party. Clean the polluting evil from your company. People will hear of what you've done and be impressed, that will put a stop to this kind of evil among you. Don't feel sorry for the person, it's life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. When you go to war against your enemy in sea horses and chariots and soldiers far outnumbering you, do not recoil in fear of them, God, your God, who brought you up out of Egypt is with you. When the battle is about to begin, let the priest come forward and speak to the troops. He'll say, Attention, Israel. In a few minutes you're going to do battle with your enemies. Don't waver in resolve. Don't fear. Don't hesitate. Don't panic. God, your God, is right there with you, fighting with you against your enemies, fighting to win. Then let the officers step up and speak to the troops, is there a man here who has built a new house but hasn't yet dedicated it? Let him go home right now lest he die in battle and another man dedicate it. And is there a man here who has planted a vineyard but hasn't yet enjoyed the grapes? Let him go home right now lest he die in battle and another man enjoy the grapes. Is there a man here engaged to marry who hasn't yet taken his wife? Let him go home right now lest he die in battle and another man take her. The officers will then continue, and is there a man here who is wavering in resolve and afraid? Let him go home right now so that he doesn't infect his fellows with his timidity and cowardly spirit. When the officers have finished speaking to the troops, let them appoint commanders of the troops who shall muster them by units. When you come up against a city to attack it, call out, Peace. If they answer, Yes, Peace, and open the city to you, then everyone found there will be conscripted as forced laborers and work for you. But if they don't settle for peace and insist on war, then go ahead and attack. God, your God, will give them to you. 
Kill all the men with your swords. But don't kill the women and children and animals. Everything inside the town you can take as plunder for you to use and eat, God, your God, gives it to you. This is the way you deal with the distant towns, the towns that don't belong to the nations at hand. But with the towns of the people that God, your God, is giving you as an inheritance, it's different, don't leave anyone alive. Consign them to holy destruction, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, obeying the command of God, your God. This is so there won't be any of them left to teach you to practice the abominations that they engage in with their gods and you end up sinning against God, your God. When you mount an attack on a town and the siege goes on a long time, don't start cutting down the trees, swinging your axes against them. Those trees are your future food, don't cut them down. Are trees soldiers who come against you with weapons? The exception can be those trees which don't produce food, you can chop them down and use the timbers to build siege engines against the town that is resisting you until it falls. If a dead body is found on the ground, this ground that God, your God, has given you, lying out in the open, and no one knows who killed him, your leaders and judges are to go out and measure the distance from the body to the nearest cities. The leaders and judges of the city that is nearest the corpse will then take a heifer that has never been used for work, never had a yoke on it. The leaders will take the heifer to a valley with a stream, a valley that has never been plowed or planted, and there break the neck of the heifer. The Levitical priests will then step up. God has chosen them to serve him in these matters by settling legal disputes and violent crimes and by pronouncing blessings in God's name. Finally, all the leaders of that town that is nearest the body will wash their hands over the heifer that had its neck broken at the stream and say, we didn't kill this man and we didn't see who did it. Purify your people Israel whom you redeemed, O God. Clear your people Israel from any guilt in this murder. That will clear them from any responsibility in the murder. By following these procedures you will have absolved yourselves of any part in the murder because you will have done what is right in God's sight. When you go to war against your enemies and God, your God, gives you victory and you take prisoners, and then you notice among the prisoners of war a good-looking woman whom you find attractive and would like to marry, this is what you do, take her home, have her trim her hair, cut her nails, and discard the clothes she was wearing when captured. She is then to stay in your home for a full month, mourning her father and mother. Then you may go to bed with her as husband and wife. If it turns out you don't like her, you must let her go and live wherever she wishes. But you can't sell her or use her as a slave since you've humiliated her. When a man has two wives, one loved and the other hated, and they both give him sons, but the firstborn is from the hated wife, at the time he divides the inheritance with his sons he must not treat the son of the loved wife as the firstborn, cutting out the son of the hated wife who is the actual firstborn. No, he must acknowledge the inheritance rights of the real firstborn, the son of the hated wife, by giving him a double share of the inheritance, that son is the first proof of his virility, the rights of the firstborn belong to him. When a man has a stubborn son, a real rebel who won't do a thing his mother and father tell him, and even though they discipline him he still won't obey, his father and mother shall forcibly bring him before the leaders at the city gate and say to the city fathers, This son of ours is a stubborn rebel, he won't listen to a thing we say. He's a glutton and a drunk. Then all the men of the town are to throw rocks at him until he's dead. You will have purged the evil pollution from among you. All Israel will hear what's happened and be in awe. When a man has committed a capital crime, 
been given the death sentence, executed and hung from a tree, don't leave his dead body hanging overnight from the tree. Give him a decent burial that same day so that you don't desecrate your God-given land, a hanged man is an insult to God. If you see your kinsman's ox or sheep wandering off loose, don't look the other way as if you didn't see it. Return it promptly. If your fellow Israelite is not close by or you don't know whose it is, take the animal home with you and take care of it until your fellow asks about it. Then return it to him. Do the same if it's his donkey or a piece of clothing or anything else your fellow Israelite loses. Don't look the other way as if you didn't see it. If you see your fellow's donkey or ox injured along the road, don't look the other way. Help him get it up and on its way. A woman must not wear a man's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. This kind of thing is an abomination to God, your God. When you come across a bird's nest alongside the road, whether in a tree or on the ground, and the mother is sitting on the young or on the eggs, don't take the mother with the young. You may take the babies, but let the mother go so that you will live a good and long life. When you build a new house, make a parapet around your roof to make it safe so that someone doesn't fall off and die and your family become responsible for the death. Don't plant two kinds of seed in your vineyard. If you do, you will forfeit what you've sown, the total production of the vineyard. Don't plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Don't wear clothes of mixed fabrics, wool and linen together. Make tassels on the four corners of the cloak you use to cover yourself. If a man marries a woman, sleeps with her, and then turns on her, calling her loose, giving her a bad name, saying, I married this woman, but when I slept with her I discovered she wasn't a virgin, then the father and mother of the girl are to take her with the proof of her virginity to the town leaders at the gate. The father is to tell the leaders, I gave my daughter to this man as wife and he turned on her, rejecting her. And now he has slanderously accused her, claiming that she wasn't a virgin. But look at this, here is the proof of my daughter's virginity. And then he is to spread out her blood-stained wedding garment before the leaders for their examination. The town leaders then are to take the husband, whip him, fine him a hundred pieces of silver, and give it to the father of the girl. The man gave a virgin girl of Israel a bad name. He has to keep her as his wife and can never divorce her. But if it turns out that the accusation is true and there is no evidence of the girl's virginity, the men of the town are to take her to the door of her father's house and stone her to death. She acted disgracefully in Israel. She lived like a whore while still in her parents' home. Purge the evil from among you. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both must die. Purge that evil from Israel. If a man comes upon a virgin in town, a girl who is engaged to another man, and sleeps with her, take both of them to the town gate and stone them until they die, the girl because she didn't yell out for help in the town and the man because he raped her, violating the fiancé of his neighbor. You must purge the evil from among you. But if it was out in the country that the man found the engaged girl and grabbed and raped her, only the man is to die, the man who raped her. Don't do anything to the girl, she did nothing wrong. This is similar to the case of a man who comes across his neighbor out in the country and murders him, when the engaged girl yelled out for help, there was no one around to hear or help her. When a man comes upon a virgin who has never been engaged and grabs and rapes her and they are found out, the man who raped her has to give her father fifty pieces of silver. He has to marry her because he took advantage of her. And he can never divorce her. A man may not marry his father's ex-wife, 
that would violate his father's rights. No eunuch is to enter the congregation of God. No bastard is to enter the congregation of God, even to the tenth generation, nor any of his children. No Ammonite or Moabite is to enter the congregation of God, even to the tenth generation, nor any of his children, ever. Those nations didn't treat you with hospitality on your travels out of Egypt, and on top of that they also hired Balaam son of Beer from Pether in Mesopotamia to curse you. God, your God, refused to listen to Balaam but turned the curse into a blessing, how God, your God, loves you. Don't even try to get along with them or do anything for them, ever. But don't spurn an Edomite, he's your kin. And don't spurn an Egyptian, you were a foreigner in his land. Children born to Edomites and Egyptians may enter the congregation of God in the third generation. When you are camped out, at war with your enemies, be careful to keep yourself from anything ritually defiling. If one of your men has become ritually unclean because of a nocturnal emission, he must go outside the camp and stay there until evening when he can wash himself, returning to the camp at sunset. Mark out an area outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourselves. Along with your weapons have a stick with you. After you relieve yourself, dig a hole with the stick and cover your excrement. God, your God, strolls through your camp, he's present to deliver you and give you victory over your enemies. Keep your camp holy, don't permit anything indecent or offensive in God's eyes. Don't return a runaway slave to his master, he's come to you for refuge. Let him live wherever he wishes within the protective gates of your city. Don't take advantage of him. No daughter of Israel is to become a sacred prostitute, and no son of Israel is to become a sacred prostitute. And don't bring the fee of a sacred whore or the earnings of a priest pimp to the house of God, your God, to pay for any vow, they are both an abomination to God, your God. Don't charge interest to your kinsmen on any loan, not for money or food or clothing or anything else that could earn interest. You may charge foreigners interest, but you may not charge your brothers interest, that way God, your God, will bless all the work that you take up and the land that you are entering to possess. When you make a vow to God, your God, don't put off keeping it, God, your God, expects you to keep it and if you don't you're guilty. But if you don't make a vow in the first place, there's no sin. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Keep the vow you willingly vowed to God, your God. You promised it, so do it. When you enter your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat all the grapes you want until you're full, but you may not put any in your bucket or bag. And when you walk through the ripe grain of your neighbor, you may pick the heads of grain, but you may not swing your sickle there. If a man marries a woman and then it happens that he no longer likes her because he has found something wrong with her, he may give her divorce papers, put them in her hand, and send her off. After she leaves, if she becomes another man's wife and he also comes to hate her and this second husband also gives her divorce papers, puts them in her hand, and sends her off, or if he should die, then the first husband who divorced her can't marry her again. She has made herself ritually unclean, and her remarriage would be an abomination in the presence of God and defile the land with sin, this land that God, your God, is giving you as an inheritance. When a man takes a new wife, he is not to go out with the army or be given any business or work duties. He gets one year off simply to be at home making his wife happy. Don't seize a hand mill or an upper millstone as collateral for a loan. You'd be seizing someone's very life. If a man is caught kidnapping one of his kinsmen, someone of the people of Israel, to enslave or sell him, the kidnapper must die. 
purge that evil from among you. Warning. If a serious skin disease breaks out, follow exactly the rules set down by the Levitical priests. Follow them precisely as I commanded them. Don't forget what God, your God, did to Miriam on your way out of Egypt. When you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, don't enter his house to claim his pledge. Wait outside. Let the man to whom you made the pledge bring the pledge to you outside. And if he is destitute, don't use his cloak as a bedroll, return it to him at nightfall so that he can sleep in his cloak and bless you. In the sight of God, your God, that will be viewed as a righteous act. Don't abuse a laborer who is destitute and needy, whether he is a fellow Israelite or foreigner living in your land and in your city. Pay him at the end of each workday, he's living from hand to mouth and needs it now. If you hold back his pay, he'll protest to God and you'll have sin on your books. Parents shall not be put to death for their children, nor children for their parents. Each person shall be put to death for his own sin. Make sure foreigners and orphans get their just rights. Don't take the cloak of a widow as security for a loan. Don't ever forget that you were once slaves in Egypt and God, your God, got you out of there. I command you, do what I'm telling you. When you harvest your grain and forget a sheaf back in the field, don't go back and get it, leave it for the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow so that God, your God, will bless you in all your work. When you shake the olives off your trees, don't go back over the branches and strip them bare, what's left is for the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow. And when you cut the grapes in your vineyard, don't take every last grape, leave a few for the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow. Don't ever forget that you were a slave in Egypt. I command you, do what I'm telling you. When men have a legal dispute, let them go to court, the judges will decide between them, declaring one innocent and the other guilty. If the guilty one deserves punishment, the judge will have him lay himself down before him and lashed as many times as his crime deserves, but not more than forty. If you hit him more than forty times, you will degrade him to something less than human. Don't muzzle an ox while it is threshing. When brothers are living together and one of them dies without having had a son, the widow of the dead brother shall not marry a stranger from outside the family, her husband's brother is to come to her and marry her and do the brother-in-law's duty by her. The first son that she bears shall be named after her dead husband so his name won't die out in Israel. But if the brother doesn't want to marry his sister-in-law, she is to go to the leaders at the city gate and say, My brother-in-law refuses to keep his brother's name alive in Israel, he won't agree to do the brother-in-law's duty by me. Then the leaders will call for the brother and confront him. If he stands there defiant and says, I don't want her, his sister-in-law is to pull his sandal off his foot, spit in his face, and say, this is what happens to the man who refuses to build up the family of his brother, his name in Israel will be family no sandal. When two men are in a fight and the wife of the one man, trying to rescue her husband, grabs the genitals of the man hitting him, you are to cut off her hand. Show no pity. Don't carry around with you two weights, one heavy and the other light, and don't keep two measures at hand, one large and the other small. Use only one weight, a true and honest weight, and one measure, a true and honest measure, so that you will live a long time on the land that God, your God, is giving you. Dishonest weights and measures are an abomination to God, your God, all this corruption in business deals. Don't forget what Amalek did to you on the road after you left Egypt, how he attacked you when you were tired, barely able to put one foot in front of another, mercilessly cut off your stragglers, and had no regard for God. When God, your God, 
gives you rest from all the enemies that surround you in the inheritance land God, your God, is giving you to possess, you are to wipe the name of Amalek from off the earth. Don't forget. Once you enter the land that God, your God, is giving you as an inheritance and take it over and settle down, you are to take some of all the firstfruits of what you grow in the land that God, your God, is giving you, put them in a basket and go to the place God, your God, sets apart for you to worship Him. At that time, go to the priest who is there and say, I announce to God, your God, today that I have entered the land that God promised our ancestors that He'd give to us. The priest will take the basket from you and place it on the altar of God, your God. And there in the presence of God, your God, you will recite. A wandering Aramean was my father. He went down to Egypt and sojourned there. He and just a handful of his brothers at first, but soon. They became a great nation, mighty in many. The Egyptians abused and battered us. In a cruel and savage slavery. We cried out to God, the God of our fathers. He listened to our voice, he saw. Our destitution, our trouble, our cruel plight. And God took us out of Egypt. With his strong hand and long arm, terrible and great. With signs and miracle wonders. And he brought us to this place. Gave us this land flowing with milk and honey. So here I am. I've brought the first fruits. Of what I've grown on this ground you gave me, O God. Then place it in the presence of God, your God. Bow low in the presence of God, your God. And rejoice. Celebrate all the good things that God, your God, has given you and your family, you and the Levite and the foreigner who lives with you. Every third year, the year of the tithe, give a tenth of your produce to the Levite, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow so that they may eat their fill in your cities. And then, in the presence of God, your God, say this. I have brought the sacred share. I've given it to the Levite, foreigner, orphan, and widow. What you commanded, I've done. I haven't detoured around your commands. I haven't forgotten a single one. I haven't eaten from the sacred share while mourning. I haven't removed any of it while ritually unclean. I haven't used it in funeral feasts. I have listened obediently to the voice of God, my God. I have lived the way you commanded me. Look down from your holy house in heaven. Bless your people Israel and the ground you gave us. Just as you promised our ancestors you would. This land flowing with milk and honey. This very day God, your God, commands you to follow these rules and regulations, to live them out with everything you have in you. You've renewed your vows today that God is your God, that you'll live the way He shows you, do what He tells you in the rules, regulations, and commandments, and listen obediently to Him. And today God has reaffirmed that you are dearly held treasure just as He promised, a people entrusted with keeping His commandments, a people set high above all other nations that He's made, high in praise, fame, and honor, you're a people holy to God, your God. That's what he has promised. Moses commanded the leaders of Israel and charged the people, Keep every commandment that I command you today. On the day you cross the Jordan into the land that God, your God, is giving you, erect large stones and coat them with plaster. As soon as you cross over the river, Write on the stones all the words of this revelation so that you'll enter the land that God, your God, is giving you, that land flowing with milk and honey that God, the God of your fathers, promised you. So when you've crossed the Jordan, erect these stones on Mount Ebel. 
then coat them with plaster. Build an altar of stones for God, your God, there on the mountain. Don't use an iron tool on the stones, build the altar to God, your God, with uncut stones and offer your whole burnt offerings on it to God, your God. When you sacrifice your peace offerings you will also eat them there, rejoicing in the presence of God, your God. Write all the words of this revelation on the stones. Incise them sharply. Moses and the Levitical priests addressed all Israel, quiet. Listen obediently, Israel. This very day you have become the people of God, your God. Listen to the voice of God, your God. Keep His commandments and regulations that I'm commanding you today. That day Moses commanded, after you've crossed the Jordan, these tribes will stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these will stand on Mount Ebel for the curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. The Levites, acting as spokesmen and speaking loudly, will address Israel. God's curse on anyone who carves or casts a God image, an abomination to God made by a craftsman, and sets it up in secret. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on anyone who demeans a parent. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on anyone who moves his neighbor's boundary marker. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on anyone who misdirects a blind man on the road. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on anyone who interferes with justice due the foreigner, orphan, or widow. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on anyone who has sex with his father's wife, he has violated the woman who belongs to his father. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on anyone who has sex with an animal. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on anyone who has sex with his sister, the daughter of his father or mother. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on anyone who has sex with his mother-in-law. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on anyone who kills his neighbor in secret. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on anyone who takes a bribe to kill an innocent person. All respond, yes. Absolutely. God's curse on whoever does not give substance to the words of this revelation by living them. All respond, yes. Absolutely. If you listen obediently to the voice of God, your God, and heartily obey all His commandments that I command you today, God, your God, will place you on high, high above all the nations of the world. All these blessings will come down on you and spread out beyond you because you have responded to the voice of God, your God. God's blessing inside the city. God's blessing in the country. God's blessing on your children. The crops of your land. The young of your livestock. The calves of your herds. The lambs of your flocks. God's blessing on your basket and bread bowl. God's blessing in your coming in. God's blessing in your going out. God will defeat your enemies who attack you. They'll come at you on one road and run away on seven roads. God will order a blessing on your barns and workplaces. He'll bless you in the land that God, your God, is giving you. God will form you as a people holy to Him, just as He promised you, 
if you keep the commandments of God, your God, and live the way He has shown you. All the peoples on earth will see you living under the name of God and hold you in respectful awe. God will lavish you with good things, children from your womb, offspring from your animals, and crops from your land, the land that God promised your ancestors that He would give you. God will throw open the doors of His sky vaults and pour rain on your land on schedule and bless the work you take in hand. You will lend to many nations but you yourself won't have to take out a loan. God will make you the head, not the tail, you'll always be the top dog, never the underdog, as you obediently listen to and diligently keep the commands of God, your God, that I am commanding you today. Don't swerve an inch to the right or left from the words that I command you today by going off following and worshipping other gods. Here's what will happen if you don't obediently listen to the voice of God, your God, and diligently keep all the commandments and guidelines that I'm commanding you today. All these curses will come down hard on you. God's curse in the city. God's curse in the country. God's curse on your basket and bread bowl. God's curse on your children. The crops of your land. The young of your livestock. The calves of your herds. The lambs of your flocks. God's curse in your coming in. God's curse in your going out. God will send the curse, the confusion, the contrariness down on everything you try to do until you've been destroyed and there's nothing left of you, all because of your evil pursuits that led you to abandon me. God will infect you with the disease, wiping you right off the land that you're going in to possess. God will set consumption and fever and rash and seizures and dehydration and blight and jaundice on you. They'll hunt you down until they kill you. The sky over your head will become an iron roof, the ground under your feet, a slab of concrete. From out of the skies God will rain ash and dust down on you until you suffocate. God will defeat you by enemy attack. You'll come at your enemies on one road and run away on seven roads. All the kingdoms of earth will see you as a horror. Carrion birds and animals will boldly feast on your dead body with no one to chase them away. God will hit you hard with the boils of Egypt, hemorrhoids, scabs, and an incurable itch. He'll make you go crazy and blind and senile. You'll grope around in the middle of the day like a blind person feeling his way through a lifetime of darkness, you'll never get to where you're going. Not a day will go by that you're not abused and robbed. And no one is going to help you. You'll get engaged to a woman and another man will take her for his mistress, you'll build a house and never live in it, you'll plant a garden and never eat so much as a carrot, you'll watch your ox get butchered and not get a single steak from it, your donkey will be stolen from in front of you and you'll never see it again. Your sheep will be sent off to your enemies and no one will lift a hand to help you. Your sons and daughters will be shipped off to foreigners, you'll wear your eyes out looking vainly for them, helpless to do a thing. Your crops and everything you work for will be eaten and used by foreigners, you'll spend the rest of your lives abused and knocked around. What you see will drive you crazy. God will hit you with painful boils on your knees and legs and no healing or relief from head to foot. God will lead you and the king you set over you to a country neither you nor your ancestors have heard of, there you'll worship other gods, no gods of wood and stone. Among all the peoples where God will take you, you'll be treated as a lesson or a proverb, a horror. You'll plant sacks and sacks of seed in the field but get almost nothing, the grasshoppers will devour it. You'll plant and hoe and prune vineyards but won't drink or put up any wine, the worms will devour them. You'll have groves of olive trees everywhere, 
but you'll have no oil to rub on your face or hands, the olives will have fallen off. You'll have sons and daughters but they won't be yours for long, they'll go off to captivity. Locusts will take over all your trees and crops. The foreigner who lives among you will climb the ladder, higher and higher, while you go deeper and deeper into the hole. He'll lend to you, you won't lend to him. He'll be the head, you'll be the tail. All these curses are going to come on you. They're going to hunt you down and get you until there's nothing left of you because you didn't obediently listen to the voice of God, your God, and diligently keep his commandments and guidelines that I commanded you. The curses will serve as signposts, warnings to your children ever after. Because you didn't serve God, your God, out of the joy and goodness of your heart in the great abundance, you'll have to serve your enemies whom God will send against you. Life will be famine and drought, rags and wretchedness, then he'll put an iron yoke on your neck until he's destroyed you. Yes, God will raise up a faraway nation against you, swooping down on you like an eagle, a nation whose language you can't understand, a mean-faced people, cruel to grandmothers and babies alike. They'll ravage the young of your animals and the crops from your fields until you're destroyed. They'll leave nothing behind, no grain, no wine, no oil, no calves, no lambs, and finally, no you. They'll lay siege to you while you're huddled behind your town gates. They'll knock those high, proud walls flat, those walls behind which you felt so safe. They'll lay siege to your fortified cities all over the country, this country that God, your God, has given you. And you'll end up cannibalizing your own sons and daughters that God, your God, has given you. When the suffering from the siege gets extreme, you're going to eat your own babies. The most gentle and caring man among you will turn hard, his eye evil, against his own brother, his cherished wife, and even the rest of his children who are still alive, refusing to share with them a scrap of meat from the cannibal child stew he is eating. He's lost everything, even his humanity, in the suffering of the siege that your enemy mounts against your fortified towns. And the most gentle and caring woman among you, a woman who wouldn't step on a wildflower, will turn hard, her eye evil, against her cherished husband, against her son, against her daughter, against even the afterbirth of her newborn infants, she plans to eat them in secret, she does eat them, because she has lost everything, even her humanity, in the suffering of the siege that your enemy mounts against your fortified towns. If you don't diligently keep all the words of this revelation written in this book, living in holy awe before this name glorious and terrible, God, your God, then God will pound you with catastrophes, you and your children, huge interminable catastrophes, hideous interminable illnesses. He'll bring back and stick you with every old Egyptian malady that once terrorized you. And yes, every disease and catastrophe imaginable, things not even written in the book of this revelation, God will bring on you until you're destroyed. Because you didn't listen obediently to the voice of God, your God, you'll be left with a few pitiful stragglers in place of the dazzling stars in the heavens multitude you had become. And this is how things will end up, just as God once enjoyed you, took pleasure in making life good for you, giving you many children, so God will enjoy getting rid of you, clearing you off the earth. He'll weed you out of the very soil that you are entering in to possess. He'll scatter you to the four winds, from one end of the earth to the other. You'll worship all kinds of other gods, gods neither you nor your parents ever heard of, wood and stone no gods. But you won't find a home there, you'll not be able to settle down. God will give you a restless heart, longing eyes, a homesick soul. You will live in constant jeopardy, terrified of every shadow, never knowing what you'll meet around the next corner. 
In the morning you'll say, I wish it were evening. In the evening you'll say, I wish it were morning. Afraid, terrorized at what's coming next, afraid of the unknown, because of the sights you've witnessed. God will ship you back to Egypt by a road I promised you'd never see again. There you'll offer yourselves for sale, both men and women, as slaves to your enemies. And not a buyer to be found. These are the terms of the covenant that God commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab, renewing the covenant he made with them at Horeb. Moses called all Israel together and said, You've seen with your own eyes everything that God did in Egypt to Pharaoh and his servants, and to the land itself, the massive trials to which you were eyewitnesses, the great signs and miracle wonders. But God didn't give you an understanding heart or perceptive eyes or attentive ears until right now, this very day. I took you through the wilderness for forty years and through all that time the clothes on your backs didn't wear out, the sandals on your feet didn't wear out, and you lived well without bread and wine and beer, proving to you that I am in fact God, your God. When you arrived here in this place, Sion king of Heshbon and O.G. king of Bashan met us primed for war but we beat them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Diligently keep the words of this covenant. Do what they say so that you will live well and wisely in every detail. You are all standing here today in the presence of God, your God, the heads of your tribes, your leaders, your officials, all Israel, your babies, your wives, the resident foreigners in your camps who fetch your firewood and water, ready to cross over into the solemnly sworn covenant that God, your God, is making with you today, the covenant that this day confirms that you are his people and he is God, your God, just as he promised you and your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not making this covenant and its oath with you alone. I am making it with you who are standing here today in the presence of God, our God, yes, but also with those who are not here today. You know the conditions in which we lived in Egypt and how we crisscrossed through nations in our travels. You got an eyeful of their obscenities, their wood and stone, silver and gold junk gods. Don't let down your guard lest even now, today, someone, man or woman, clan or tribe, gets sidetracked from God, our God, and gets involved with the no-gods of the nations, lest some poisonous weed sprout and spread among you, a person who hears the words of the covenant oath but exempts himself, thinking, I'll live just the way I please, thank you, and ends up ruining life for everybody. God won't let him off the hook. God's anger and jealousy will erupt like a volcano against that person. The curses written in this book will bury him. God will delete his name from the records. God will separate him out from all the tribes of Israel for special punishment, according to all the curses of the covenant written in this book of Revelation. The next generation, your children who come after you and the foreigner who comes from a far country, will be appalled when they see the widespread devastation, how God made the whole land sick. They'll see a fire-blackened wasteland of brimstone and salt flats, nothing planted, nothing growing, not so much as a blade of grass anywhere, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which God overthrew in fiery rage. All the nations will ask, why did God do this to this country? What on earth could have made him this angry? Your children will answer, because they abandoned the covenant of the God of their ancestors that he made with them after he got them out of Egypt, they went off and worshipped other gods, submitted to gods they'd never heard of before, gods they had no business dealing with. So God's anger erupted against that land and all the curses written in this book came down on it. 
God, furiously angry, pulled them, roots and all, out of their land and dumped them in another country, as you can see. God, our God, will take care of the hidden things but the revealed things are our business. It's up to us and our children to attend to all the terms in this revelation. Here's what will happen. While you're out among the nations where God has dispersed you and the blessings and curses come in just the way I have set them before you, and you and your children take them seriously and come back to God, your God, and obey Him with your whole heart and soul according to everything that I command you today, God, your God, will restore everything you lost, He'll have compassion on you, He'll come back and pick up the pieces from all the places where you were scattered. No matter how far away you end up, God, your God, will get you out of there and bring you back to the land your ancestors once possessed. It will be yours again. He will give you a good life and make you more numerous than your ancestors. God, your God, will cut away the thick calluses on your heart and your children's hearts, freeing you to love God, your God, with your whole heart and soul and live, really live. God, your God, will put all these curses on your enemies who hated you and were out to get you. And you will make a new start listening obediently to God, keeping all His commandments that I'm commanding you today. God, your God, will outdo Himself in making things go well for you, you'll have babies, get calves, grow crops, and enjoy an all-around good life. Yes, God will start enjoying you again, making things go well for you just as He enjoyed doing it for your ancestors. But only if you listen obediently to God, your God, and keep the commandments and regulations written in this book of Revelation. Nothing half-hearted here, you must return to God, your God, totally, heart and soul, holding nothing back. This commandment that I'm commanding you today isn't too much for you, it's not out of your reach. It's not on a high mountain. You don't have to get mountaineers to climb the peak and bring it down to your level and explain it before you can live it. And it's not across the ocean, you don't have to send sailors out to get it, bring it back, and then explain it before you can live it. No. The word is right here and now, as near as the tongue in your mouth, as near as the heart in your chest. Just do it. Look at what I've done for you today. I've placed in front of you. Life and good. Death and evil. And I command you today, love God, your God. Walk in His ways. Keep His commandments, regulations, and rules so that you will live, really live, live exuberantly, blessed by God, your God, in the land you are about to enter and possess. But I warn you, if you have a change of heart, refuse to listen obediently, and willfully go off to serve and worship other gods, you will most certainly die. You won't last long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today, I place before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your children will live. And love God, your God, listening obediently to Him, firmly embracing Him. Oh yes, He is life itself, a long life settled on the soil that God, your God, promised to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses went on and addressed these words to all Israel. He said, I'm 120 years old today. I can't get about as I used to. And God told me, you're not going to cross this Jordan River. God, your God, will cross the river ahead of you and destroy the nations in your path so that you may oust them. And Joshua will cross the river before you, as God said he would. God will give the nations the same treatment he gave the kings of the Amorites, Sion and Og, and their land, he'll destroy them. 
God will hand the nations over to you, and you'll treat them exactly as I have commanded you. Be strong. Take courage. Don't be intimidated. Don't give them a second thought because God, your God, is striding ahead of you. He's right there with you. He won't let you down, he won't leave you. Then Moses summoned Joshua. He said to him with all Israel watching, Be strong. Take courage. You will enter the land with this people, this land that God promised their ancestors that he'd give them. You will make them the proud possessors of it. God is striding ahead of you. He's right there with you. He won't let you down, he won't leave you. Don't be intimidated. Don't worry. Moses wrote out this revelation and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the chest of the covenant of God, and to all the leaders of Israel. And he gave these orders, at the end of every seven years, the year all debts are cancelled, during the pilgrim festival of booths when everyone in Israel comes to appear in the presence of God, your God, at the place he designates, read out this revelation to all Israel, with everyone listening. Gather the people together, men, women, children, and the foreigners living among you, so they can listen well, so they may learn to live in holy awe before God, your God, and diligently keep everything in this revelation. And do this so that their children, who don't yet know all this, will also listen and learn to live in holy awe before God, your God, for as long as you live on the land that you are crossing over the Jordan to possess. God spoke to Moses, You are about to die. So call Joshua. Meet me in the tent of meeting so that I can commission him. So Moses and Joshua went and stationed themselves in the tent of meeting. God appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud. The cloud was near the entrance of the tent of meeting. God spoke to Moses, You're about to die and be buried with your ancestors. You'll no sooner be in the grave than this people will be up and lusting after the foreign gods of this country that they are entering. They will abandon me and violate my covenant that I've made with them. I'll get angry, oh so angry. I'll walk off and leave them on their own, won't so much as look back at them. Then many calamities and disasters will devastate them because they are defenseless. They'll say, isn't it because our God wasn't here that all this evil has come upon us? But I'll stay out of their lives, keep looking the other way because of all their evil, they took up with other gods. But for right now, copy down this song and teach the people of Israel to sing it by heart. They'll have it then as my witness against them. When I bring them into the land that I promised to their ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they eat and become full and get fat and then begin fooling around with other gods and worshipping them, and then things start falling apart, many terrible things happening, this song will be there with them as a witness to who they are and what went wrong. Their children won't forget this song, they'll be singing it. Don't think I don't know what they are already scheming to do, and they're not even in the land yet, this land I promised them. So Moses wrote down this song that very day and taught it to the people of Israel. Then God commanded Joshua son of Nun saying, Be strong. Take courage. You will lead the people of Israel into the land I promised to give them. And I'll be right there with you. After Moses had finished writing down the words of this revelation in a book, right down to the last word, he ordered the Levites who were responsible for carrying the chest of the covenant of God, saying, Take this book of revelation and place it alongside the chest of the covenant of God, your God. Keep it there as a witness. I know what rebels you are, how stubborn and willful you can be. Even today, while I'm still alive and present with you, 
you're rebellious against God. How much worse when I've died. So gather the leaders of the tribes and the officials here. I have something I need to say directly to them with heaven and earth as witnesses. I know that after I die you're going to make a mess of things, abandoning the way I commanded, inviting all kinds of evil consequences in the days ahead. You're determined to do evil in defiance of God, I know you are, deliberately provoking his anger by what you do. So with everyone in Israel gathered and listening, Moses taught them the words of this song, from start to finish. So Moses wrote down this song that very day and taught it to the people of Israel. Then God commanded Joshua son of Nun saying, Be strong. Take courage. You will lead the people of Israel into the land I promised to give them. And I'll be right there with you. After Moses had finished writing down the words of this revelation in a book, right down to the last word, he ordered the Levites who were responsible for carrying the chest of the covenant of God, saying, Take this book of revelation and place it alongside the chest of the covenant of God, your God. Keep it there as a witness. I know what rebels you are, how stubborn and willful you can be. Even today, while I'm still alive and present with you, you're rebellious against God. How much worse when I've died. So gather the leaders of the tribes and the officials here. I have something I need to say directly to them with heaven and earth as witnesses. I know that after I die you're going to make a mess of things, abandoning the way I commanded, inviting all kinds of evil consequences in the days ahead. You're determined to do evil in defiance of God, I know you are, deliberately provoking his anger by what you do. So with everyone in Israel gathered and listening, Moses taught them the words of this song, from start to finish. A wildfire burning deep down in Sheol, then shooting up and devouring the earth and its crops, setting all the mountains, from bottom to top, on fire. I'll pile catastrophes on them. I'll shoot my arrows at them. Starvation, blistering heat, killing disease. I'll send snarling wild animals to attack from the forest. And venomous creatures to strike from the dust. Killing in the streets. Terror in the houses. Young men and virgins alike struck down. And yes, breastfeeding babies and gray-haired old men. I could have said, I'll hack them to pieces. Wipe out all trace of them from the earth. Except that I feared the enemy would grab the chance. To take credit for all of it. Crowing, look what we did. God had nothing to do with this. They are a nation of idiots. They don't know enough to come in out of the rain. If they had any sense at all, they'd know this. They would see what's coming down the road. How could one soldier chase a thousand enemies off? Or two men run off two thousand? Unless their rock had sold them. Unless God had given them away. For their rock is nothing compared to our rock. Even our enemies say that. They're a vine that comes right out of Sodom. Who they are is rooted in Gomorrah. Their grapes are poison grapes. Their grape clusters bitter. Their wine is rattlesnake venom. Mixed with lethal cobra poison. Don't you realize that I have my shelves? Well stocked, locked behind iron doors. I'm in charge of vengeance and payback. Just waiting for them to slip up. And the day of their doom is just around the corner. Sudden and swift and sure. Yes, God will judge his people. But oh how compassionately he'll do it. When he sees their weakened plight. And there is no one left, slave or free. 
He'll say, So where are their gods? The rock in which they sought refuge. The gods who feasted on the fat of their sacrifices. And drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them show their stuff and help you. Let them give you a hand. Do you see it now? Do you see that I'm the one? Do you see that there's no other God beside me? I bring death and I give life, I wound and I heal. There is no getting away from or around me. I raise my hand in solemn oath. I say, I'm always around. By that very life I promise. When I sharpen my lightning sword. And execute judgment. I take vengeance on my enemies. And pay back those who hate me. I'll make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword will gorge itself on flesh. Feasting on slain and captive alike. The proud and vain enemy corpses. Celebrate, nations, join the praise of his people. He avenges the deaths of his servants. Pays back his enemies with vengeance. And cleanses his land for his people. Moses came and recited all the words of this song in the hearing of the people, he and Joshua son of Nun. When Moses had finished saying all these words to all Israel, he said, Take to heart all these words to which I give witness today and urgently command your children to put them into practice, every single word of this revelation. Yes. This is no small matter for you, it's your life. In keeping this word you'll have a good and long life in this land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess. That same day God spoke to Moses, Climb the Abram mountains to Mount Nebo in the land of Moab, overlooking Jericho, and view the land of Canaan that I'm giving the people of Israel to have and hold. Die on the mountain that you climb and join your people in the ground, just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and joined his people. This is because you broke faith with me in the company of the people of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, you didn't honor my holy presence in the company of the people of Israel. You'll look at the land spread out before you but you won't enter it, this land that I am giving to the people of Israel. Moses, man of God, blessed the people of Israel with this blessing before his death. He said, God came down from Sinai. He dawned from Seir upon them. He radiated light from Mount Paran. Coming with ten thousand holy angels. And tongues of fire. Streaming from his right hand. Oh, how you love the people. All his holy ones are palmed in your left hand. They sit at your feet. Honoring your teaching. The revelation commanded by Moses. As the assembly of Jacob's inheritance. Thus God became king in Jeshurun. As the leaders and tribes of Israel gathered. Reuben. Let Reuben live and not die. But just barely, in diminishing numbers. Judah. Listen, God, to the voice of Judah. Bring him to his people. Strengthen his grip. Be his helper against his foes. Levi. Let your Thummim and Urim. Belong to your loyal saint. The one you tested at Massa. Whom you fought with at the waters of Meribah. Who said of his father and mother. I no longer recognize them. He turned his back on his brothers. And neglected his children. Because he was guarding your sayings. And watching over your covenant. Let him teach your rules to Jacob. And your revelation to Israel. Let him keep the incense rising to your nostrils. And the whole burnt offerings on your altar. God bless his commitment. 
Stamp your seal of approval on what he does. Disable the loins of those who defy him. Make sure we've heard the last from those who hate him. Benjamin. God's beloved. God's permanent residence. Encircled by God all day long. Within whom God is at home. Joseph. Blessed by God be his land. The best fresh dew from high heaven. And fountains springing from the depths. The best radiance streaming from the sun. And the best the moon has to offer. Beauty pouring off the tops of the mountains. And the best from the everlasting hills. The best of earth's exuberant gifts. The smile of the burning bush dweller. All this on the head of Joseph. On the brow of the set-apart one among his brothers. In splendor he's like a firstborn bull. His horns the horns of a wild ox. He'll gore the nations with those horns. Push them all to the ends of the earth. Ephraim by the ten thousands will do this. Manasseh by the thousands will do this. Zebulun and Issachar. Celebrate, Zebulun, as you go out. And Issachar, as you stay home. They'll invite people to the mountain. And offer sacrifices of right worship. For they will have hauled riches in from the sea. And gleaned treasures from the beaches. Gad, blessed is he who makes Gad large. Gad roams like a lion. Tears off an arm, rips open a skull. He took one look and grabbed the best place for himself. The portion just made for someone in charge. He took his place at the head. Carried out God's right ways. And his rules for life in Israel. Dan, Dan is a lion's cup. Leaping out of Bashan. Naphtali. Naphtali brims with blessings. Spills over with God's blessings. As he takes possession. Of the sea and southland. Asher. Asher, best blessed of the sons. May he be the favorite of his brothers. His feet massaged in oil. Safe behind iron-clad doors and gates. Your strength like iron as long as you live. There is none like God, Jeshurun. Riding to your rescue through the skies. His dignity haloed by clouds. The ancient God is home. On a foundation of everlasting arms. He drove out the enemy before you. And commanded, destroy. Israel lived securely. The fountain of Jacob undisturbed. In grain and wine country. And, oh yes, his heavens drip dew. Lucky Israel. Who has it as good as you? A people saved by God. The shield who defends you. The sword who brings triumph. Your enemies will come crawling on their bellies. And you'll march on their backs. Moses climbed from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, the peak of Pisgah facing Jericho. God showed him all the land from Gilead to Dan, all Naphtali, Ephraim, and Manasseh, all Judah reaching to the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev and the plains which encircled Jericho, city of palms, as far south as Zor. Then and there God said to him, this is the land I promised to your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the words, I will give it to your descendants. I've let you see it with your own eyes. There it is. But you're not going to go in. Moses died there in the land of Moab, Moses the servant of God, just as God said. God buried him in the valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor. No one knows his burial site to this very day. 
Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyesight was sharp, he still walked with a spring in his step. The people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses came to an end. Joshua son of Nun was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. The people of Israel listened obediently to him and did the same as when God had commanded Moses. No prophet has risen since in Israel like Moses, whom God knew face to face. Never since has there been anything like the signs and miracle wonders that God sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his servants, and to all his land, nothing to compare with that all-powerful hand of his and all the great and terrible things Moses did as every eye in Israel watched.